does recent scholarship tell us about the active role enslaved people played on the eve of the Civil War? Historian Carrie Greenwich will be here to talk about two new books, South to Freedom and The Kidnapping Club. Was Ted Kennedy the most accomplished of the Kennedy brothers? Neil Gabler will be here to discuss the first volume of his two-part biography, Catching the Wind. Alexandra Alter will have an update from the publishing world. Plus, our critics will join us for the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. It's December 18th. I'm Pamela Paul. Carrie Greenwich joins us now from outside Boston. She is the Mellon Assistant Professor in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University. She's also the author of Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. And this week, she reviews two books on the cover of the book review. They are South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico and the Road to the Civil War by Alice L. Baumgartner and The Kidnapping Club, Wall Street, Slavery, and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War by Jonathan Daniel Wells. All right, that's a lot. Carrie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So it's interesting looking at these two books together. They're sort of an obvious pair, but they tell two different sides of the same story. Just if you could tell us broadly, what are the two books about? Certainly. The book by Jonathan Daniel Wells, The Kidnapping Club, it talks about the organized terror inflicted on Black New Yorkers by The Kidnapping Club, which was a group of investors, business owners, and police officers in New York City in the years before the Civil War. And they used the fugitive slave law to re-enslave, to kidnap African Americans who were living nominally free in New York and transporting them back into the South. And then we have Alice Baumgartner's beautiful South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico, which traces the journey of escaped slaves to Mexico, again, in the decades before the Civil War, and the relationship between Mexico, freedom, and concepts of race and citizenship. So the story of the kidnapping club, if it is at all familiar to listeners, it's probably most familiar as the story that was told in the recent film, 12 Years a Slave. It was a sort of lightly fictionalized version of the memoirs of Solomon Northrup. But what's the larger story here? The larger story, which I think Jonathan Daniel Wells does extremely well, is a story of the complicity of the North in enslavement and in slavery and the fact that American slavery was a national and a transnational institution. And that to argue that somehow New York City was acknowledged as a free state, although that was true, because slavery was a national and international institution, the powers that be in New York in the years before the Civil War were dedicated to upholding that system. And so it really goes into the heart of this notion, what does it mean to be a free person, a free African-American in a country and in a global system that endorsed racial slavery? The other thing that I think Jonathan Daniel Wells' book does very well is connect the distrust, the relationship between the police and law enforcement, particularly in New York City, but we can use that as a, a microcosm of parts of the country, between New York City's police department and authorities and the Black community, and this real betrayal that the Black community felt, justifiably so, and experienced at the hands of the police being an organized club to kidnap particularly Black children and send them back into the South. All right. So obviously there are some contemporary parallels. But one thing I thought was so interesting that you point out in your review is the extent to which the various powers from the insurance business to the sort of finance community to the law community was entrenched in maintaining the slave trade. Can you talk about the extent to which the early capitalist economy of New York City sort of thrived and depended on slavery? So in Wells' book, he shows that the, number one, there was a cultural connection between the financiers in Wall Street in New York City and slavery in the South. And so all of the banks, all of the investment firms, all of the capital that was funding the system that it took to maintain enslavement, for instance, investing in the distribution of food, the distribution of goods that were sent into the South to maintain slavery, that was a business and that was run 
through Wall Street's financial system. And so what Wells argues and shows is that that system was dependent upon Southern slavery. Southern slavery was dependent upon that system. And so there was a vested interest by very, very powerful people, organizations in New York City to maintain and to ensure that slavery existed. There was also a very vested interest in ensuring that fugitive slaves who escaped would be returned to the South, given the fact that we're talking about Black bodies as commodities and the fact that if a Black person escaped, that was, in the crude terms of the time, somebody losing money and investment. And so this whole machinery of kidnapping African-Americans and sending them back into the South, it was a business and it was making a lot of money for a lot of people. What was the kidnapping club? I mean, was this an actual club and who started it and who were the members? So the kidnapping club was the term coined, as well as points out, by David Ruggles, who was a African-American abolitionist who lived in New York City. And as an abolitionist, he was the one who coined this term to talk about how the connections between investments, bankers, investment companies, and banks in the slave system. And members of it included, he mentions two, specifically Tobias Boudinot and Daniel Nash, who were police officers in the city of New York. And they wielded a lot of power within the city through Tammany Hall. And we think of Tammany Hall as being this source of corruption after the Civil War. But what Wells points out so beautifully is that it's this mechanism of democratic governance in the city that was in partnership with the police department. And the two together, the police department through Boudinot and Nash and the terrorism inflicted upon the Black community was coordinated between Tammany Hall and the police department. And what was the New York Vigilance Committee? The New York Vigilance Committee was a group of African-Americans who basically argued that Black people should defend themselves against this assault by the police department and by authorities in New York. And so Ruggles started this society. Frederick Douglass eventually used it to help him as he escaped from Baltimore to the North. And as secretary of this group, David Ruggles really argued that Black people should be monitoring, should be surveying the Black community for people who were out to kidnap uh, particularly Black children, but sort of harass the Black community. And so this committee consisted of Black abolitionists. It consisted, as the years went on, some white supporters. And it helped relay slaves from New York City who were under the surveillance or the harassment of the police and send them out of New York to places further north. And how effective were they? They were very effective in terms of causing many white anti-slavery activists who were against slavery, but who many of whom did not understand the depths of in which the North was complicit in the slave trade and, and returning Black people to slavery. The Vigilance Committee really brought attention to the fact that this was an issue and a crisis. Ruggles, for instance, had a newspaper called The Mirror of Liberty, and through it, he publicized these cases, which Wells documents very well and uses the Black press, these cases that were not for him documenting them. Most of the rest of the city would have not recognized that they existed. And so publicizing that this was happening, coordinating with three Black communities throughout the North through the Black press, and really getting Black people who were harassed by the police and kidnapped by the police, getting them into these networks of abolitionists so that they could receive assistance. People have a sense at this point in history that New York City wasn't exactly on the side of the right and the good, generally speaking, on the eve of the Civil War and fought in many ways or certain people in power in New York fought against the abolition of slavery. But this book seems to offer a level of detail around how that actually worked and, and why that resistance to abolishing slavery was so strong. The less known story, I think, for many people is probably the one told in Alice Baumgartner's book, South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico and the Road to Civil War. So tell us a little bit about the story she is relaying in her book. Baumgartner's book is this beautiful rendering of the relationship between the Civil War and this global politics that is happening in the area of the mid-19th century. And she traces the escape of enslaved people from the United States to what eventually became Mexico and talks about the complicated relationship between Mexico and the United States, but uses the specific journey of African-American people enslaved, most of them enslaved, some of them free, over the border into what became Mexico. We have to remember that the border between what we now know as Mexico and the United States, that was actually originally the country or the colony of New Spain underneath Spanish control. 
there was a war and eventually Mexico became a republic of its own. And when that happened, there was this migration of Southern slaveholders, specifically to Mexico, to spread slavery into the into the West. And so really what Baumgartner shows is in what ways the Civil War is not just an American war. It is a war that took place in the Americas and complicated this relationship between the United States and bordering countries. All right, let's give a little bit of background about what the laws were at the time, both on the United States side and on the what was then the New Spain side. So beginning in the U.S., and I think this is, covers part of this period, what were the confiscation acts? So within the United States, in the federal constitution, it allowed that property was protected underneath the constitution. And so because African-Americans were considered property, there was a push going back in the 1780s for slaveholders to have protections if their property was absconded. And basically that meant if slaves ran away. And so there was a long history of African-American people fleeing not just from plantations, but realizing that they had to flee somewhere, particularly if they were on the southwestern border, to a place where American laws could not find them. And so people, African-American people in what is now present-day Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, fleeing over the border into what was then Spain. And Spain actually had slavery, but Spain also had a policy that enslaved people once they came into what was then considered New Spain, had certain rights and protections once they crossed that border. Was this the Siete Partidas? Siete Partidas, yes, which basically was a royal decree through the Spanish government that said enslaved people could not be mistreated by their owners. And if there was evidence of them being mistreated, being physically abused, of being unduly exploited, that the crown would protect them. And so many African-Americans fleeing from, for instance, Louisiana, and Baumgartner uses these sort of vivid stories of enslaved people being taken over the border from Louisiana into New Spain, and the enslaved people themselves recognizing that they could flee to one of the states in New Spain and plea underneath Siete Partidas, and that then they could receive protections. And so this was a long history of the relationship between African people fleeing over the border into New Spain. What then happened was once white slaveholders began to settle into what was then called Tejas, which we now know of as the region of Texas, after the Mexican War, when Mexico became a republic. After that happened, African-American people began to see Mexico as replacing New Spain as a place where they could receive protection. So Mexico eventually outlawed slavery. Mexico also eventually signed a treaty with Haiti in which there was this this vision of creating a multiracial republic that stretched from Mexico down through the peninsula into the Caribbean. And so many African slaves saw Mexico as this alternative, as this barrier between enslavement and the United States. When did Mexico ban slavery? So 1821 is when Mexico puts into law the notion that There is no slavery within the Mexican Republic, but the Mexican government did allow protections for migrants to Tejas, which was this northern section with Mexico, for them to bring their property with them. So one of the things that Baumgartner does in her book that is very astute is looking at how it was that even though slavery is ending and was ending in Mexico, that white slaveholders continued to move into this area that's called Tejas, and bring their slaves with them. And the arguments and the sort of geopolitical consequences of that dynamic between the Mexican government and then these white American slaveholders who migrated with their slaves into Tejas. So we have to remember that this is the 1830s, and it is Mexico in the 1830s at a time when the central government had a hard time policing, administering, patrolling kind of these northern frontiers, what was considered the frontier in Mexico. And so white settlers bringing their slaves into Tejas and then basically planting themselves there until they were confronted either by the slaves themselves or by the Mexican government. What exactly was the impact of the Siete Partidas and the anti-slavery laws in 1821 in Mexico on the way in which we thought about slavery and the politics around slavery laws in the United States at that time. It really brought to the attention of both Mexico and white Southerners 
that African American people would continue to escape, that they were this form of what was called at the time kind of troublesome property, that if African Americans were given this safety valve into New Spain and then that became Mexico, that they would take advantage of it. So what this did was it it made it so that the United States and Mexico, the entire relationship between those two countries into and including the Mexican-American War, was based upon this idea of slavery and what would these two republics be? Would Mexico be a place of freedom where they were allowed to accord freedom to people who came into its borders? Or would the United States continue to expand into the West? And so it really alters the way we think of the Mexican-American War, particularly for people who are from the what we now call the Southwestern United States, this idea that there's this constant exchange of African-American people, and that that exchange itself led to this conflict between Mexico and the United States, and eventually to the Mexican-American War, which then gave us the southwestern United States. It sounds like together these two books are trying to reframe the history of 19th century American politics around slavery and around race into saying, you know, this is as much shaped by Black resistance to enslavement as it was by the institution of slavery itself. Would that be accurate? Yes. And I think that's the beauty and the contribution of both of these books is that it really takes the focus away from the North being a place of freedom, that slavery ended because good people in the North and good white people in the North knew that slavery was wrong and fought against it, and that that's how slavery ended. Really what these two books argue is that there's a complicity in this relationship between the North and the South and enslavement. There's a vested interest by the most populated city in the country, New York City, in maintaining enslavement, and that really slavery begins to collapse. It's challenged. It's pushed by African-American people themselves, first by them running away. And then what does this mean that African-Americans are people and by their very running, they alter and change the politics of the places from which they came and the places to which they ended up? I mentioned early on in introducing you that you work in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism and Diaspora at Tufts University. So you're obviously familiar with the sort of academic work in this area. Is this part of a kind of larger trend within race studies and American history re-examining this period? Yes, I think that this this idea of ethnic studies, this idea of Latinx studies, this idea of diasporic studies, the real impetus behind that and our department at Tufts is questioning the very idea of what boundaries and nation states mean, questioning well, what does race and what does colonialism mean? What are the consequences of dealing with actual human beings within the politics of race and colonization and anti-colonization and diaspora as they exist. So I think this is is where the field is headed. I think historians have a long way to go, but I definitely think this is where historians are looking. They're looking to see the Civil War, see the 19th century, not merely in terms of an American Civil War, but in how it is that the American Civil War and America interacts with, is shaped by both the people within it and then the borders and the nation states with which it interacts. Certainly when you look at this from a book's perspective, you know, it's the wars that people really want to read about, at least judging by the number of books published, you know, World War I, World War II, and of course, the Civil War. And so there's no shortage of books around this subject. One of the things I'm wondering is, is there new research or are these scholars looking at new kinds of research in digging deeper within this period? If you have an ethnic studies RCD lens, and my department, we it's shorted to RCD. If, when you have that lens, it really allows you to question the archives that you're looking at. So always going into the sources. But one of the things I love about Wells's book in particular is going really into the records of these companies in New York City, right? Why would a Northern police department be so vested in returning fugitive slaves to the South, right? And so relying on the archive, but really questioning what it is that the archive is showing you and and really broadening what the archive means. You know, looking at the life of a David Ruggles in Wells' book, for instance, looking at this vigilance committee, for instance, not looking at it as something that is one instance of Black resistance, but the fact that that is an institution that had a pattern of resistance. And in Baumgartner's book, really questioning, well, what did it mean that you had slaveholders moving into New Spain and then moving into Mexico when we know that both New Spain and Mexico had very different ideas of property and of property? 
slavery and what happened when African-American people crossed that border and how would that then create their relationship. And the only reason you wouldn't look at those sources is if you're arguing that somehow African-American people are not human beings, right? That they're not taking advantage of the borders that are designed to enslave them. Totally fascinating. Re-examination of the origins of the Civil War and the kind of road to the abolishment of slavery in this country. Carrie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And these are these are wonderful books. And I I, I really hope people read them. They, they have a, an ability to change the discourse surrounding the Civil War. Well, the titles of those books, again, are South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico and the Road to the Civil War by Alice L. Baumgartner and the Kidnapping Club, Wall Street, Slavery and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War by Jonathan Daniel Wells. Both of them reviewed by our guest, Carrie Greenwich, who is the author herself of a very acclaimed book, which you also should read, Black Radical, <laughs> The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Carrie, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. Neil Gabler joins us now from Amagansett, New York, to talk about his latest book, a biography of Ted Kennedy. It's called Catching the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, 1932 to 1975. Neil, thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So the first question I always have when I'm looking at the first of a two-volume or three-volume biography is, did you know from the get-go that that's the way this was going to work out? Or did you think you were writing a one-volume book and it just became clear that it couldn't be contained? I thought it was going to be a one-volume book until fairly recently, in fact. I intended the book to be one volume because I think there's a thematic line that runs through it. And uh, I wanted the book to have that kind of integrity both narratively and thematically. But we got to the point where my publisher, Crown, came to me and said that they thought it would be advisable to divide it into two, that the book would simply be too large. Volume two is larger than volume one. So it would have been a book of roughly 1,500 written reading pages, exclusive of footnotes and bibliographical material and all of that. So when, when they approached me with that, they let me make the decision. I thought about it long and hard because, again, I, I think about these books and I try and craft these books, and it was a single volume in my mind. But when I examined it, I thought, you know, there is a breaking point here. And the breaking point is that so much of what happens up to 1975 is Edward Kennedy riding the wind or catching the wind, the liberal wind. And then what happens afterward is really Edward Kennedy sailing, as he said in a very famous speech of his, against the wind. And, and I thought, well, it's appropriate then that we divide this into two volumes, that we tell the story of the ascendance of liberalism and the story of the decline of liberalism, each volume dealing with those things respectively. Well, it's interesting then that it, this ends in 1975. One might think of that as a more conservative period given Nixon's election. So why 1975 is the kind of end point of this liberal hour before you go to the against the wind? Part of this biography. Well, Richard Nixon advanced conservatism, but with Watergate, he also set it back. And liberals in the in the 1974 you know midterm election, liberals gained power, Democrats gained power, and so they got a, a kind of respite. Really, they got a second breath after the heyday of the liberal hour in the uh, 1960s, mid 1960s during the Great Society. So they got that second win. But it, by 1975 when Gerald Ford was in power, that second wind was already beginning to die. And the book ends, I don't want to give a, you know, I should give a spoiler alert here, but I don't know that it's necessary when you're dealing with political history. But the book ends with, a, with, a, with an episode that, you know, I think is really kind of salient. And that is the episode of the anti-busing protests in Boston in 1974 and into 1975, when the Irish and Italian white Bostonians marched to oppose a court-ordered busing integration. And Ted Kennedy was kind of caught betwixt and between because these ethnic whites were Ted Kennedy's people. These were the people who had always supported the Kennedys. But on the other hand, the Kennedys were, and particularly Ted Kennedy, were great supporters of the African-American community. And so Ted was, was caught in a kind of pincer between these two forces. 
And though he was not adamant about the court ordered busing, it wasn't as if he went out there and said, you've got to do this. He was adamant about integration. And what that caused, and this is again, the concluding episode in the book. And I think it's a very you know, tense, tense episode and a, and a very terrifying episode for Ted Kennedy is these crowds literally turned on him and chased him and threw things at him and beat him. One of them had a, a, a standard to the American flag and they shoved it at him and poked him like a spear. And Ted Kennedy, this is literally true. Ted Kennedy literally had to run for his life and he escaped into a MTA station, the subway station, where his aides held back the crowds who were going after him. And fortunately for him, a train arrived just as he escaped into the station. And he jumped on that train. And even then, the crowds retreated and followed, tried to follow, and they jumped in their automobiles and followed that train. But this was an episode that in some ways was the harbinger of what was to come, which was the anger of white ethnic America at the liberal agenda. So going back to that initial question about these two volumes, it sounds like you had already written the entire thing when this decision was made to divide it into two. I had. I had. Yes. The, the, the both, both books, well, I didn't think of them as both books, but, but the book was complete. And volume two will be published next year, a year after volume one. So I, I had in my mind, you know, I, I knew exactly where I wanted the book to go when I started it. I know Robert Carroll says that he always writes the last sentence first, but basically what I do is I outline the entire book. In this case, it turned out to be two books, but I knew exactly where this book was going. I knew where every chapter was. I knew where virtually every beat in the book was because that's how I write. I, I, I believe, Pamela, in a kind of metaphysics of writing, by which I mean that readers can detect the process of your writing. They know when you're struggling. They know when you're hitting bumps. And I do everything in my power to preload a book so that there are no bumps. And that the book, I, I like to think, you know, reads almost musically because I've done so much preparation that when I actually sit down to write, I write very quickly, astonishingly quickly to, to my editors and, and even my agent so that, I, so that the book just flows because I want the book to just absolutely flow. This is going to be very painful for many of the writers and aspiring writers <laughs> uh, who listen to us to hear. But this isn't your first biography, of course. You've written biographies of Walter Bunchell and Walt Disney, most notably. I'm sure each of them has their challenges. What were the particular challenges of writing a biography of Ted Kennedy? There have been many, many books about the Kennedys. Ted has written his own memoir. What was the biggest challenge for you? Well, that's a challenge, of course. When there are other books out there, I would never write a book where I felt, and this is not an insult to any other writer who's written about Kennedy, not by any means is it an insult, but if I felt that any previous biographer had done what I intended to do with this book, you know, I wouldn't have written the book. I'm not that egocentric that I think, well, I'm going to be better than everybody else. I approached this book as a biography of Edward Kennedy, but also equally a biography of American liberalism. So there was that challenge. But the biggest challenge in this book is I hate to write without papers. I hate to write without complete access to everything. And when I wrote about Walter Winchell, all of his papers were being auctioned. And I actually went to the auction house and I spent several weeks you know, because that's all I had going through every document I could with a tape recorder from morning till night. The auction house let me stay there. And I spent God knows how many hours doing that. When I wrote about Walt Disney, the Disney archive, I spent years literally in the Disney archives going through all of Walt Disney's papers from the deed that his great grandfather had had in Canada to the last papers before his death. Here, the papers were all sealed. And they were only now being opened. And I hated the idea of writing a biography without papers. But there was also another challenge, and that was that the Kennedy family was not cooperative. I would never write an official biography. That is something I would never, ever do. It's just not how I do that. I'm not an authorized biographer. But it was difficult because although the Kennedys are secretive, 
and they operate, as I say in the book, under a kind of code of omerta, where nobody talks about anything. Still and all, I love to sit down and conduct lengthy interviews. And I was able to get some of those, but with only one family member, and that was Patrick Kennedy. Patrick Kennedy, the youngest son of, younger son, I should say, of Edward Kennedy, was the only one who uh, was very generous with his time. I spoke with Ted Jr., but he finally decided not to cooperate, and I didn't get any cooperation from Vicky, and that was difficult. But I finally made the decision, and I wrestled with this decision. I finally made the decision that I, I didn't think the book would be significantly different without having those interviews, because they had given interviews to the oral history, the Edward Kennedy oral history at the Miller Center at University of Virginia. I had access to all of those interviews, and they'd been interviewed numerous times in various other places, and I read all of those. So in the final analysis, I bit the bullet and I said, I'm going to proceed with the book even without that material. So just a note to listeners, Vicki is Ted Kennedy's widow, and she's still alive. Oh, yes, she is. And, and still active. That was one of my questions about access, because, of course, as you say, they famously deny access to almost everyone. If you had known going in that they were not, by and large, going to talk to you, do you think you would have even embarked on the project? Or did you go in thinking you would get them on board somehow? I always think that I'm going to get the cooperation of the family. When I wrote Walter Winchell, the family was very difficult to find, frankly, but in the final analysis, they did cooperate. His granddaughter cooperated with me. In the case of Walt Disney, Diane Disney Miller, Walt Disney's daughter, a sole surviving daughter, would not speak to me for, I would say, the first six years that I worked on the book. But finally, finally, I got a phone call from her and she said that she would cooperate. And I flew out to San Francisco, which is where she lived. And uh, and she was very cooperative, though it turned out in the final analysis, she didn't like the book. But uh, <laughs> and, and, and many of the things she didn't like were the very things she told me, which I always thought was somewhat ironic. But I, I was hoping in this case that I would get that. I'm not sure whether I would have proceeded had I known that the family would be uncooperative. But again, once I was into the project, I told myself that, you know, the book would not be, uh, as I said earlier, significantly different that I had so much material. I had talked to so many people. I had read so many interviews that I felt I had the material I needed to tell the story I wanted to tell. Now, obviously, the book would have been different had Vicki Kennedy sat and talked to me or Ted Jr., but you play the hand you're dealt, and that was the hand I was dealt. We all think we know. We all have images of sort of what each Kennedy was like. How would you characterize Kennedy coming out of your research for this book? And did anything surprise you about him as a man, as a person? A lot of things surprised me. I, I can't think I came into this book. I try never to prejudge. I never write hagiography or demonography. I mean, I try and take the story where it leads. And though I admired the Kennedys, I didn't particularly feel that this was going to be, you know, I was going to genuflect before them. But I always thought of Ted Kennedy the way that I think most people thought of Ted Kennedy. He was a hugger. He was a glad hander. He was boisterous. He was more a Fitzgerald, speaking of his grandfather, Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, who was at one time a congressman and a mayor of Boston, who was also a glad handing retail politician. I always thought of Ted Kennedy that way, the happiest of the Kennedys, the least complicated of the Kennedys. And I have to admit, the least intelligent of the Kennedys, which was the general characterization of him. I found, you know, I spent over 10 years on this book, that that characterization was partially correct. Yes, he did love retail politics. He was a hugger. He was a glad hander. He was in many ways more Fitzgerald than he was a Kennedy. But I also found that that was misleading. Ted Kennedy was a very complicated man. He was a very melancholy man in many moments of his life. We see, and I say this explicitly in the book, you know, we see the public Ted Kennedy, this boisterous figure, but we don't see the private Ted Kennedy, the one who would spend hours staring out at the sea, the one who was a fatalist, who believed that as his brothers were killed, he would be next, who was certain that he was going to take an assassin's bullet. We don't see that Ted Kennedy. We don't know that Ted Kennedy. We don't know the Ted Kennedy who spent hours and hours and hours poring over legislation, 
and learning, going to Harvard professors to be tutored, to get the background for legislation so that he could debate on the floor of the Senate with the very best of them. And he became one of the best of them. We don't know that, Ted Kennedy. We saw the tip of that iceberg, but there was so much of that iceberg that was under the water. And that was the Ted Kennedy who in many ways to me was not only unfamiliar, but in many respects, the real Ted Kennedy, the deep, melancholic, fatalistic Ted Kennedy. And he dominates the book. Your title here is Catching the Wind. It sounds like the title of your next volume might be Against the Wind. The title of- It is the title. It is the title. Okay, there we go. Um, And the title of Kennedy's own memoir was True Compass, which I thought was a really interesting book, but obviously all of them sailing metaphors. But two questions. One is, what was the role of sailing? Obviously, it sounds like it was very central to Ted Kennedy, but also- How accurate was his own memoir? You you know, you talk about the melancholy and tragedy in his life. Did you think that he knew himself well and did he portray that? Did that come through in True Compass? I'll hold the the nautical metaphors for a moment because they are important and, and they are a key, I think, to understanding Ted Kennedy. The Kennedys are known for because they were trained by their parents to be resilient stoic, facing tragedy. I don't want any sourpusses, Joe Kennedy would say. No tears in the Kennedy family, Joe Kennedy would say. And so when they face these tragedies, what we saw was that face of stoicism. I think there's some of that in True Compass. You know, Kennedy reveals himself, but like all Kennedys, he only reveals himself so much. And there's a wonderful line I quoted in the book, that I think it was Timothy Shriver, one of the Kennedy cousins, son of Sergeant Shriver, said to Patrick Kennedy, which is the family pathology is secrecy. Everything was secret, including emotion. And you never revealed emotion. There is some of that kind of circumspection in True Compass. But there is also something else in True Compass. There are moments of self-reflection I don't think that until the end of his life, he was a terribly introspective or self-reflective individual, because I don't think he wanted to allow himself that. I think he was afraid of what he would find. There's a story that Patrick Kennedy told me where he and his father had had an argument and he had disappointed his father in, in some sense. And Ted Kennedy, unable to express fully what what he wanted to express to his son, or perhaps, you know, holding in his emotion, took him into the library. And he took down a volume of The Enemy Within, which was Robert Kennedy's description of the racket committee hearings, which Robert Kennedy was the majority counsel during. And he opened the book and it was inscribed by Bobby to Ted. And he said to my brother, Teddy, who has his own enemies within. And I think Ted understood that, that he had his own enemies. He was fighting those enemies. And to be too introspective would loose those enemies. What were those enemies? I think part of it was his own sense of his own fallibility, his own sense of his lack of worth, which I think he lived with all of his life. The single most important line, I think, in True Compass, and the most introspective line probably in the entire book, although it's something of a throwaway line, is I never felt I was the equal of my brothers. Well, he felt that way. His family felt that way. The general public felt that way. And I think it was a very difficult thing for him to contend with, that he was so fallible, that he wasn't a great man. And he wanted so much to be a great man because the legacy of the Kennedys imposed by Joe Kennedy was greatness. You have to be great. You have to be great. Now, ironically, I think most people, well, not maybe not most, but many, many people would say that he turned out to be, in terms of the things he contributed to the public wheel, the greatest of the Kennedy brothers. But he never felt that way. And he, he strove to want to feel that way, but he couldn't. 
let's end on something we you brought up earlier, which is the nautical metaphor. What role did sailing play in his life? Well, first of all, the sea played a great role in his life. I said he wasn't the most introspective of men, and he wasn't, but he was very introspective about the sea, that it, it continues on forever. It's unchanging. You can't conquer it. You only can submit to it. And that was the way he saw life. This was a man who believed he could accomplish great things, but also understood the parameters about those things. I think Ted Kennedy saw the sea sort of the way that Robert Kennedy or Kabu saw the sun. The sun taught him that everything is in history, that there are larger forces in the world, and, and that you have to deal with those forces. All right. Well, clearly, we will have to have you back on to talk about volume two. We didn't even mention Chappaquiddick, obviously, another <laughs> a, a whole big subject unto itself and not unrelated to what you're you're talking about. But we'll leave it here for now. Neil, thanks so much for being here. Thank you again for the invitation. I appreciate it. Neil Gabler's new book is called Catching the Wind, Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, 1932 to 1975, the first in a two-volume biography of Ted Kennedy. Alexander Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. What's new in the publishing world? So we're sort of taking stock of the year, which was a very unusual year, as we've discussed many times. There were an incredible number of challenges that publishers and authors faced. Most prominently, I think, the closure of bookstores, which are still suffering, stresses on the supply chain, shifting pub dates because the supply chain was challenged, or maybe an author wanted to wait till they could potentially have a tour. That turned out not to be the case in the fall either. So it was a year of major upheaval, but also kind of a positive year. The more people I talk to about this, the more consensus I hear from publishers and agents that everyone is shocked by how well the industry has withstood all the challenges to the economy. So, you know, the latest figures from NPD BookScan, which tracks sales through early December, show that print sales are actually up almost 8% this year over last year. And if you look at ebook sales and audiobook sales, which the Association of American Publishers has been tracking, those have been up by double digits, which is not surprising. You know, when people aren't able to get out to the store, they're they're buying things digitally. Book publishers have continued to see really strong interest in what in what they're selling. And there have been a lot of great new books that have come out. The latest sales figures for former President Barack Obama's memoir, A Promised Land, were pretty astronomical. It sold more than 3.3 million units across all formats in the U.S. and Canada in its first month. So that is a huge number. I mean, that's the kind of thing that can put retailers in really good shape for the year to have a hit like that come out at the end of the year. Obviously, there's still a little bit of time left in the holiday season, and that's the time of year that independents in particular are really dependent on sales. So there have been a lot of pleas beginning weeks ago for people to get their orders in early. All these independents are having to ship stuff. You know, they're not necessarily having a ton of foot traffic. So that can delay things. So hopefully people have, have put in their orders and this will be a good holiday season for booksellers as well as publishers. Let us hope. All right, Alexandra, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Joining us now to talk about what they're reading and reviewing are critics Dwight Garner and Carl Sagel. Hey, guys. Good morning, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. All right. It is December. There are not a lot of sort of big new books out, but maybe it's an opportunity for some smaller books to get attention. What books did you all review this week? Let's start with you, Dwight. Oh, I, I feel like I got lucky, Pamela. I, I used to follow sports quite a lot when I was younger. I don't follow quite as much anymore. I sort of, I would say that I'm the kind of sports fan who reads the front page of the sports section, but doesn't read the second page, you know. But I remember quite well when I was in high school, John Thompson, who coached Georgetown, its basketball team, this very tall black man who was just a brilliant coach, and he led the team to a national championship in 1984. And he was one of the very rare black college basketball coaches at the time, and there still aren't enough of them, frankly. 
Thompson died about two months ago, and, and now his memoir has come out that he's written with a ghostwriter, and it's quite good. I mean, it, it describes his upbringing in the projects of Washington, D.C. in the in the 40s and 50s, and, and his realization that his height and his athletic ability might take him some places in America. And it's very good on the racism his parents faced. I mean, his father never learned to read or write. His mother had a degree in education and was forced to do day work cleaning for white people. And it's good about how he made it into basketball and into the rather closed world of coaching. Red Auerbach, the famous coach of the Boston Celtics, was his sort of mentor and, and helped him. And the book is just more complicated than you might think and, and more well-written and more thought through than you might think about, about basketball, about young people, about race. It's just a pretty solid book, and I was glad to have a chance to read it. Carl, do you read basketball books? No, I don't follow basketball books or sports, but I do follow, as annoying a statement this as might be, Da Vinci books. And I reviewed, <laughs> I really do. I will read them all. Like there's certain genres, like if there's a memoir about a withholding mother he was or pretty a athletic. Da Vinci show biography, <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was, I will read and hopefully if you'll let me review this book. So I went back to November. Um, there was a book that I kind of had my eye on, but I got busy with other things and, you know, casting around for books in December, I went back and decided to, to look at this one. It's called The Shadow Draw by an art historian named Francesca Fiorani. And look, like, there's nothing in this book that comes as a grand revelation. But the argument that she's trying to make is that this idea of da Vinci as this polymath, as this Renaissance man is very reductive. You know, the prevailing argument floated by Freud, mischievously as always, has been that as da Vinci grew older, he abandoned painting for science. And, you know, he only really completed 15 paintings in 40 years. He did paint less and less. And he did write more and more and become more interested in everything from like aeronautics to geology. But what Fiorani wants to say is that for him, knowledge was indivisible. It was continuous. And um, his paintings were the places that he wanted to experiment with what he was learning. Painting was his language, his preferred mode of communication. So anything that he was learning about optics or learning about geology or learning about personality or the psyche, he took it to the paintings and explored it there. And, you know, again, so maybe not not huge revelations, but, you know, she brings really fresh force to this argument. And especially if you're interested in things like perception and optics and and sort of these, you know, interesting close readings of the paintings, this book is is very, very pleasurable to read. What are you guys going to read over holiday vacation? That's a great question. Dwight, what are you reading? You know, I woke up last night. I couldn't sleep. I was vaguely distraught in the way you are sometimes when you can't sleep. And I went downstairs and I found this book of James Fenton's poetry. He, of course, is the British poet. He's now, I think, in his early 70s. And his poems are very tight and very metrical and sort of rhymed. And I found that reading at my dining room table at two in the morning, these really tightly constructed rhyming poems was really, I, I'm so over, and I, I'm as guilty as anyone, but I'm so tired of people saying, oh, the solace I found in books. But, you know, sometimes you find <laughs> goddamn solace in books. And I really did at two in the morning reading James Fenton last night. <laughs> Dwight, this is, we're so, we're in sync, but in completely opposite ways, because I'm going to read some poetry too. But, you know, I really like to be irritated and aggravated by reading and don't like to be consoled and swayed. So I think I'm just going to read a ton of Larkin, which I always end up reading in <laughs> December. And I just find that I need a little bit of misanthropy always around this season. Sort of, Absolutely. Uh, and Fenton, honest. Fenton has some of that. And I believe Fenton knew Larkin. Um, I believe they were friends. So there's mm. a, here we are. Here's a link in our reading. We end on friendship and poetry <laughs> and old British men. All right, Carl, <laughs> Dwight, let's run down the titles of the books you reviewed. I Came as a Shadow by John Thompson. And I reviewed The Shadow Drawing by Francesca Fiorani. All right, Carl, Dwight, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, not right away, but I do. The Book Review Podcast is produced by the great Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with a major assist from my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. <laughs>